Let's open our Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Our subject tonight is why the law? Why the law? Romans chapter 7. We're at verse 7 down to verse 14. We're talking about the principles of the righteousness of God. It started at chapter 1, verse 18, after the introduction of the opening 17 verses. And it goes all the way to the end of chapter 8. Principle 1 was condemnation. Why are we all condemned? Why do we need a Savior? Chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 20. The second principle is justification. The act of God, whereby he declares us righteous on the basis of our faith in the Lord Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 21, to chapter 5, verse 21. We're in that section known as sanctification, which is also an act of God by which he separates us, not only from the consequences of sin, but the good news for the believer, he separates us from the power of sin as well. Chapter 6, verse 1 to chapter 7, verse 25. And then principle 4 will be security when we get to chapter 8, and we're getting close. Now, under the sanctification, we looked at the following things. If you've been staying with us, uh, in chapter 6, verses 1 to 10, our realization of certain facts. Three times he said, know this, know this, know this. Chapter 3, 6, verse 3, 6 and 9. Secondly, we looked at our responsibility to these facts. And uh, two words really captured verses 11 to 23 of chapter 6. One is yield. Whatever you yield to, that's the one you become a slave to. And the second word, obey. Whoever we yield to, that's the one we should obey. And we become servants to the Lord and to God rather than servants to sin. Well, chapter 7 has often been called one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible to understand. We got started last time. We're talking about our relationship to the law. It's hard to know how to treat the law. The law doesn't have anything wrong with it. What is the problem? Well, we know that we're not under the law. There are things the law said that are, frankly, a little bit uh, heavy in terms of a burden upon us. And so we keep asking, what, what is our relationship to the law? We know the word law is used 523 times in the Bible, 223 of them in the New Testament, 148 by Paul alone, 78 of those are in Romans, and the interesting thing, 23 of them in chapter 7 alone. It's the key word, law. We started with the illustration of marriage, verses 1 to 6. I don't know about you, if you had as much struggle understanding it as I had teaching it, but I'll tell you, that's not easy to understand. It seems quite simple, simple illustration. But to really understand it in my life, that's not easy. Because sometimes these things seem quite alive and not as dead as God said. Something's wrong. I think our next step is going to be helpful, and that is in verses 7 to 14, our subject tonight. We'll call it the instruction of the law. At least the verse begins, verse 7, what shall we say then? Go back to chapter 6, verse 1. This is really a key to unlocking this section on sanctification. In chapter 6, verse 1, we have the same phrase. What shall we say then? And the question was asked, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? This came off chapter 5, verse 20, where it said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Well, then why don't we go out and sin up a storm so God can manifest his grace? And, of course, the answer to that is, God forbid. How could we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? So that was the issue of grace, really. How do we interpret the grace of God that is greater than all of our sin? And that's why he asked, what shall we say then? The second one we faced was in chapter 6, verse 15. Look at that. He said, what then? The issue here is freedom. Because in verse 14 he said, Sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. Notice the flow of that. You start with the issue of grace. If it's bigger than sin, then why not continue in sin so it can really manifest itself? And that's foolishness, of course. But you can see human reasoning there. And then asking the next question, well, if we're not under the law, but under grace, then why not ask the question, shall we sin? Because we're not under law? Let me ask you, 
Do you think there are believers who actually believe, or at least practice, that they have a license to sin because they're not under the law? Oh, absolutely. Our freedom in Christ is not a freedom to sin. It's a freedom not to sin, but it's not a freedom to sin. Interesting. So the issue of grace leads to an issue of freedom. And boy, how it does in our life, depending on how you understand those. So what's the issue here in chapter 7, verse 7? It's the issue of sin itself. What shall we say is a law of sin? I mean, after all, it certainly uh, has brought the knowledge of sin. So is, a, is there something wrong with the law? And the answer of Paul is, of course not. Now, we're going to try to answer that. Why the law? Why the law? And that's a very important issue. Let's look to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Father, we pray that in these few moments you will open up our hearts to what your reasons are for the law of God, that we'll understand how we have been set free, but to understand that freedom in the midst of your wonderful grace and knowing that there's nothing wrong with your law. Help us, Lord, to see it and to understand it, we pray. In the name of our Messiah, our Lord Jesus, amen. Now, chapter 7, verse 7, let's watch it carefully. What shall we say then is the law of sin? Here's this familiar answer. God forbid, or certainly not, absolutely no. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought or worked in me all manner of concupiscence. You know, a lot of people say, oh, let's get rid of that old King James word. Did you know it's not archaic? There are other cultures who speak better English than us who use the word. I like what one little kid said to me after hearing it in a junior high camp. I don't know what it is, but sure sounds bad. Concupiscence. According to the Bible, all manner of it was worked in me. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Boy, that's spiritual defeat, isn't it? And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? And again, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Wow. Everybody understand that clearly? Amen. We can go home now. I'll tell you, it is a tough chapter, chapter 7. Now, in chapter 7, uh, we have a number of things that are suggested here that I'd like to just share before we break down this passage. It seems to me that if the inclination to sin, whatever that is, comes through the law, which is really implied back in even chapter 7, verse 5, if that's the way it happens, then isn't it saying that there's something sinful about the law? See, that's where the conclusion, that's the question. Uh, if a rabbi was sitting in front of his students, and Romans is a very Jewish book, and doing catechism, that's what he's really asking. If your inclination to sin comes through the law, which seems to be implied here, well, then isn't there something wrong with the law? Then a second question is going to arise uh, when we come down to verse 13. And the point being there that if the law is, as he says in verse 12, holy and good and just, then why can't the law make us holy? Is everybody okay? You understand? If the law is so good and it's holy and it's just, then why can't that law make us good? And that's a part of the problem. That's what this text is setting up. And of course, the real struggle that you and I have is going to be described in our next message. 
beginning at chapter 7, verse 15. So let's ask the question, why the law? And I want to give you seven answers to that. In verses 7 to 14, why the law? Number one in verse 7, the first reason for God's law is that the law removes our ignorance of sin. Flat out, that's what it does. The law removes our ignorance of sin. We read in verse 7, I had not known sin, but by the law. And he gives a colossal, awesome illustration, the one that affects all of us. Thou shalt not covet. Do you know anything that's more troubling than that? Thou shalt not covet. I want to give you a little illustration of because I know you don't want me to illustrate with you, so I'll be the guinea pig here. Uh, I don't really have a car that is easy to get in and out being my size. Amen? Some of you have seen that, and, and I really don't. And every time I get in the car, I'm thinking, you know, I should really get something bigger. Now, this past weekend, I was in Reno, Nevada, And I noticed almost everybody had this nice big truck. I got into a lot of those trucks, and man, I could step right in it. There was no strain whatsoever. I thought, this is really good. And then I had, of course, my notes for tonight and studying them as well over the weekend. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's just like the Lord to put those trucks out there knowing that I want a truck. So I could sit in, or at least a bigger car, that he would do this to me when I'm trying to study and I run into this, thou shalt not covet. Now let me give you another one. I think a lot of you know that I really like ice cream. I really do. I don't feel sinful in that, but I like ice cream. Now I'm going through the airport. Why? Why, I ask you, do the best ice cream, they're sitting right in front of the gate where I'm going to go. It's right there. God wouldn't have put it there if he didn't want me to have it. Do you understand now? I mean, that's how bad your reasoning gets. I walked over there. You know, this still is in my mind. Thou shalt not covet. I walk over there, and every single kind that I like is there. Why would God have it there if he didn't want me to get some? And I'm sitting here fighting with this text, thou shalt not covet. Now, why am I sitting just because I want some ice cream? This is stupid. I'm smarter than that, and yet I'm under conviction. Do you know I never got the ice cream? Because I want you to go, oh. See, I need a little compassion from you. But I decided, I'm going to take the step of not getting it. You know, I got in the plane, and the first thought came to my mind. I just, I'm an illustration of this text. I got so legalistic that I, I, I illustrated the text. And my dear friends, don't tell me that the law doesn't remove our ignorance of sin because it does it does go back to romans 3 19 and 20 nobody has an excuse the law removes all ignorance you can't claim ignorance romans 3 19 and 20 we know that whatever things soever the law saith it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before god Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is the transgression of God's law. Now, in chapter 7, verse 7, telling us that the law removes our ignorance of it, it is interesting that he brought up the problem of lust, isn't it? By the way, my old King James says, For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. Interestingly, in Greek, the word lust and the word covet are exactly the same. In fact, that word can also be used in a good sense. The Bible teaches the Holy Spirit lusts. Now, the Bible teaches that when a man desires the office of leadership in the church, he is using the same word. No, it can be a good sense, it's strong desire. But in this sense, it's evil. Why? You tell me. Because the law said so. And what does our culture want? We want everything that we want. There's a four-letter word down there in the mall 
that's very attractive. What is it? Sale. You all know it. It's very attractive. And the bigger the letters, the more we think we really got a deal here. Now, they may have raised the prices in order for us to think that we're getting a deal. I don't know what they do, but that word is attractive. Lust, strong desire. It's in a lot of areas. It can be through eating and through sex and through uh, a sale and materialism and greed and all kinds of things. Interesting that he would bring that up. Thou shalt not covet. Let me show you why. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Remember, the law removes our ignorance of sin. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. Look at this carefully. Remember, it was the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you've heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you. Here it is. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Is that the law? Amen. But I say unto you that whoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Did the Lord Jesus carry this issue to not simply the doing of it, but the desiring of it? Yes or no? Yes, he certainly did. Now, hearing that, it kind of gets more convicting. You see, you could walk through your whole life saying, well, I've never committed adultery, but did you ever desire to have a relationship with anybody other than your spouse? If you did, you have already violated God's law. When the law comes, we see the nature of our sinfulness. We're more sinful than if we had not known it. As long as I could keep from doing something, my legalism says... I'm clean. I'm clear. No. Jesus said, no, you're not. If you desire it, it's as though you've done it. Pretty heavy. Go to John 8, 44, or just listen. He said, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. There is no truth in him. He's the father of lies. Now, according to the Bible, you and I, when we lust, we're following our father, the devil. Man. In the very book of Romans that we're in, back in chapter 1, very interesting, verse 24, he said, Romans 1, 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. Wow. Wow. In chapter 6 of Romans, before we got to chapter 7, in verse 12, he said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. In chapter 13 of Romans, verse 14, chapter 13, verse 14, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. In Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit and you will not carry out or fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. These are contrary one to another. You cannot do what you want to do. 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee youthful lust. James 1, 13, no man can accuse God of leading him to sin. Every man is led away of his own, tell me, lust. In 1 Peter 2, 11, He warns us about lust that will destroy and war against our souls. In 1 John 2, he says, love not the world. Stop loving the world for all that's in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You know, I feel like saying, thanks a lot, Paul. Out of all that you could have mentioned, out of 613 commandments, you picked that one. Thou shalt not covet. We wouldn't have known the seriousness of that. By the way, Colossians tells us covetousness is the same as idolatry. We would never have known that. We wouldn't argue that. Because we see a man without the Lord, without the word, he never argues it. After all, we have a right to what we want, we say. But when we come to know the Lord, we know that the Bible is constantly emphasizing the danger of our lusts and our desires, that they can be very evil. What makes them evil? And you can see how some people will say, well, it must be the law then that makes them evil, because the law gave me the knowledge, and I never would have known had the law not said this was all wrong. So did the law do this to me? You can understand why they're thinking that way through Romans 7. 
because the law flat out removes our ignorance of sin. Let's come to a second matter, Romans 7. In verse 8, 9, and I think you need to add verse 11 as well, we learn that the law resurrects our sinful desires. This is interesting. That when the law comes to you, you hear about what God wants you to do, what's right and what's wrong. Does that cause you to be immediately broken and humble and say, amen, boy, that is the truth that I'm going to follow the Lord? No, what we have is the more you tell somebody not to do something, they all of a sudden want to do it more. There's a problem here. Why the law? It first removes the ignorance of sin, but secondly, it resurrects your sinful desires. Did you know that God wants you to understand that? That's kind of troublesome in this passage. Let me just show you what he says. Verse 8, sin, the old King James says, taking occasion by the commandment. Can't you understand why many people hearing Paul would think, well, you're saying the law is causing me to be sinful. It took occasion by the commandment. It worked in me all manner of concupiscence, every kind of lifestyle that was against your law and didn't want to follow the Lord at all. Down in verse 11, for sin taking occasion by the commandment. The New International and the New American Standard use the word opportunity. New International says seizing the opportunity. New American says taking the opportunity. This very interesting passage. I want to give you three things about the fact that the law resurrects our sinful desires and see if it helps you to understand. One thing I learned about Romans 7 is you almost have to come to chapter 8 before you ever get out of this mess. In other words, chapter 7 is intended to drill into our heads that without the Lord we aren't going to make it. And some of us are still pretty arrogant about it. We think we can handle things. We trust ourselves, and we don't see the enormity of our own depravity. And that's what chapter 7 is going to do to us. So when the law resurrects our sinful desires, here's three simple statements, just based on what Paul said. First of all, in the opening of verse 8, he says that sin stirs the evil desires, not the law. Watch that carefully, verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, worked in me. You see, it wasn't the law that did it, which was in our minds as we think about, well, if I got the knowledge of sin by the law, maybe there's something wrong with the law, or the law is causing me to sin. No. Sin stirs the evil desires, not the law. We've got to be straight on that. Number two, the interesting thing about verse 8 is he says, without the law, sin was dead. So I put it this way, sin stays hidden and unknown without the teaching of God's law. Why do people not want the Ten Commandments visible in public? Why do people not want to hear about what God says is right and what's wrong? Because the truth of the matter is when you hear that, that God said this and it's his law, guess what happens? You see your own sin. Sin is very evident because the law is exposing it. The law is revealing it. And that's why people don't want to see the law. I don't want to hear about the law. I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want anybody stopping me. Sin will always stay hidden and unknown without the teaching of God's law. I was in a uh, church not too long ago, and a pastor asked me about preaching from God's law. He doesn't preach the Old Testament. And I said, well, that's God's word. It surely is the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament quotes voluminously from it. Why wouldn't you teach the Old Testament? He had a real problem with the law. And he was trying to tell me that, 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 you know, I I, I just don't think we're under law. I don't think we should be uh, bringing that up to Christians. And and I said, well, what what about non-Christians understanding why they need a Savior? And this led to a discussion which really was interesting. Do you know in our culture, the pitch, excuse me, but I want that word, the pitch we give to people is often will add Christ to your already busy and fruitful life. Or, you know, you don't have enough love and peace, but if you get Jesus, you'll have it. 
Now, believe me, Jesus will put peace and love and comfort in your heart. But that isn't the reason. You understand, because we don't preach the law, and I'm not talking about the law as a means of salvation. We've already learned from Paul that that isn't so. But if you don't bring up the law and what's right and what's wrong, then we, in fact, do not see the enormity of our own sin and depravity. It does not lead you to the Savior. And that's what the Bible says is the purpose of the law. But we don't see it. And so if we don't preach it and they don't hear it, they sort of conclude that we're okay. You know, when I study the law of God, I realize I'm not okay. Sin stirs evil desires, not the law, and sin stays hidden and unknown without the teaching of God's law. Here's the third one. Look at verse 11, please, and what it says. It says, sin, again, using the words taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So the third thing is that sin slays us by using the law. Oh, yes, it does. It takes occasion, says King James, New International, New American, opportunity. Now, this is a very interesting fact. Uh, The Greek word aformin is used seven times, translated occasion or opportunity. It's dealing with the base of operations. If you understand what he's saying is sin, using what God says is right or what's wrong, will deceive you, and by that will really slay you, really wipe you out. That's what it does. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, take heed that we don't fall. Don't be deceived. In 2 Corinthians eleven three, 3, it says, but I fear as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. The enemy's trying to deceive us. Go over to Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians 5, and look at verse 13. Sin takes the opportunity. It sets up a base of operation on the, on the law itself. It will try to convince you that the law of God is not correct. There must be another interpretation. It will use the law to make you feel that God is unjust, legalistic, and too hard on us. That is not uh, what we should do. We should realize we're not under the law and that we can do whatever we want to do. Let me, let me show you why. I, I, I know this is confusing. Believe me. It takes a while to get it straight. I'll give you an example. I happen to believe, and I, I want to state before I say this, that uh, good men disagree on this. I happen to believe that alcoholic beverages are condemned in the Bible. I happen to believe that. And uh, I've got arguments on this on tape and in book. If you want to read those and then argue, fine. I know some Christians disagree with me, and I know that uh, they don't see any problem in alcoholic beverages. The thing that bothers me is that when this issue has ever come up, it's amazing how many folks through the years have said, just in passing, well, we're not under law, we're under grace. Is everybody listening? You see, I I could give you other issues that might be a little more pointed, but I'll just use that because it's kind of simple. In other words, because they want a drink or want the alcohol for whatever reason, they say, "Well, well, you know, we're not under law, we're under grace. Now, what has that got to do with it? You see, it's interesting to me that what Paul said here is that sin will deceive us. It will deceive us, and by it, it will slay us. And it will actually use the commandment of God to deceive us. Man, I ask you, is that what the serpent did in the garden? Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of the trees of the garden. Because God knows that in the day you eat of it, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Obviously, if he already set it up and said something's wrong then if you do this, uh, he knows that you would be like him. Sin always deceives you, no matter what the issue is. Thou shalt not steal. Well, (laughs) I mean, the company, they don't care whether you take their pens or not. I mean, come on, give me a break. I mean, I understand robbing a bank, but, you know, taking the pens that the company has, I mean, they write this off. You know, I know what they do. 
You don't need to worry about that. Now, if you did that today, I understand you're under great conviction because I brought it up. See, it even illustrates what the text is saying. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. It's very heavy. But the truth, you tell a child, don't put your hand in the fire. Now, I had this happen to one of our children when they were little. And the fire was on the stove. And he was out there playing with his little hand. I said, don't put your hand there. It's going to be burned. I went out, and you know, I, <laughs> something just told me, look back. So I just cracked open the kitchen door, and sure enough, he's looking around to see if I'm here, just so he could stick his head. He stuck his head in there with, ow! And he came running to me, oh, daddy, daddy, daddy. And I said, did we stick our head in the fire? Sin deceives you. It actually uses the commandment. Stirs within you the evil desire to break it in some way. Always with a compromising state. After all, we're not under law, we're under grace. I mean, what's the big deal? It's not a heavy thing here. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, it it wasn't exactly that. See, what it was, was I, well, it's kind of like a white lie. A white lie? A lie is a lie. You see... That's what sin does, and it will slay us. It will wipe us out. Have you got to Galatians 5.13? I gave you a lot of time. 5.13, look at this. This is a usage of our word occasion or opportunity, and boy, does it illustrate it. It says, for brethren, you've been called into liberty. Praise the Lord, I'm free. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the what? What does it say? Flesh, your depravity. Isn't that interesting? The word occasion, opportunity, exactly the same as what we have in Romans chapter 7. Watch out. Instead, by love, serve one another. 1 Timothy, go there, chapter 5. Maybe this will be helpful too. 1 Timothy 5, verse 14. Here's another issue of taking occasion or seizing the opportunity, making a base of operation by which we'll be deceived. 1 Timothy 5, verse 14. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. Look at this. Give none occasion. There it is again. Same word. This time, to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You see, that's what sin does. It sets up the occasion, the opportunity, which Satan then knows exactly how to use. And before we know it, we're wiped out. Back to Romans 7. What have we said so far? Why the law? First, because it removes our ignorance of sin. Secondly, because it resurrects our sinful desires. Apparently, God wants that to happen so that we will understand our depravity. A profound sense of our depravity will lead us to humility and brokenness. An ignoring of your sinfulness will lead to self-righteousness and pride and no longer trusting the Lord as you should. The third thing I mentioned is verse 10. That is that the law requires the penalty of death. He said, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Leviticus 18.5 says, if you keep the law, you will live. But Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 says, there's not a just man on the earth who does what is good. As the psalmist said, There's none that doeth good, no, not one, which Paul quoted in Romans chapter 3. Hebrews 10, 28 says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. The law requires a penalty of death. I decided to do a quick survey. I'll just summarize it for you, but you might find great profit looking it all up. The little phrase in Old King James, shall surely be put to death. I found 28 times in the law. The soul that sins will die. The law requires the penalty of death. Paul is setting up an argument here that's really powerful. Let's come to number four, verse 12. The law reflects the character of God himself. Better be careful attacking the law. The law reflects the character of God himself. Verse 12, wherefore the law is holy 
and the commandment holy and just and good. By the way, Paul called it the law of God several times, not only here in Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 25, but also in chapter 8, verse 7. He calls it the law of who? The law of God. The law reflects the character of God. Jesus often said, in uh, looking at verse 11, when it says, by the commandment, I notice how often Jesus said, the commandment of God. Like Matthew 15, 3 and 6. The point is, that when we read the law, what's right, what's wrong, etc., we are seeing the character of God reflected. A lot of people never looked at it that way. The law is God in, in, in a very essential nature type sense. He is the law. It is his law. It's what he is. It's his character. And there are three words here that describe it that I think summarize the character of God in terms of this context. What do we need to know about God by the law? Verse 12, it is holy, it is just, and it is good. Three points he makes about God and the law that affects his argument. Let's break it down. First of all, when he said it's holy, he means it's not sinful at all. Some people were implying, well, the law, there must be something wrong with it. No, there's not. The law is not sinful. It is, in fact, holy. And by the way, neither is God. There is no sin in him. God is like light, and there's no darkness in him at all. It is impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6, 18. There's no sin in him whatsoever. And there's no sin in the law at all. It is holy, totally apart from sin. Number two, when it says it's just, it means it's fair in what it demands. God has never asked you and me to do anything that isn't fair. God is a fair God. He is a just God. And yet, what do people do? They question God's fairness. Several years ago, I was preaching at Long Beach State University back in the days of the riots. And I kind of miss those days. Campus life is boring today, but... Everybody's trying to make money. But anyway, back there, we really believed things. We tore down buildings and burned things. Oh, we believed it. We just can't remember what it was we believed in. But anyway, those were exciting days. And they had what they call free speech platforms, as you know. They were set up all over the University of California system. And so I, along with others, we joined in the process of, you know, trying to witness and share the gospel of Jesus Christ in these free speech platforms. It was a funny day. In fact, I believe you could put a sign around your neck saying you're Moses, put on sackcloth and ashes. You could probably get a thousand kids to follow you at noon hour. That's how dumb that time was. It was unbelievable. But I remember this. It was the Long Beach State University, and uh, I was speaking on who is Jesus. There was a microphone. And they always had microphones for the kids to come up and ask the speakers on a free speech platform questions. And I had spoken about the issues of the gospel. And some guy came up afterwards and he said, your God sends people to hell. He's not fair. He's not just. I just want God to be fair with, with me. And I stepped up the microphone. And I said, well, at least I know the difference between you and me now. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, uh, you want God to be fair with you. I don't. If God's fair with me, I'll be in hell. I don't want his justice, I want his mercy. Everybody understanding? But the world out there is saying he's not fair. He's not just. Reminds me of a, a call very early this morning. Somebody called about the hurricane in Florida. And uh, why would God do that? It just doesn't seem right. And... Uh, why does he let the weather be so uncontrolled? I said, well, he doesn't. And I knew she was going to be troubled over this one. But I said, well, the psalmist said, fire, earthquake, and stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Well, she blew her stack. What, you trying to say God could cause that? Oh, absolutely. The Bible says he could cause fire and earthquake and stormy wind. You've got to be kidding me. No, I, I'm telling you. God knows what's happening. He could stop it if he wanted to. He apparently didn't want to. 
And I don't know what destroy. I know God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's clear in the Bible. So he, but whatever he's allowing to happen, it's all for a purpose. In fact, I hate to tell you this, man, but it's going to get worse. What do you mean it's going to get worse? Oh, there's a time coming called the tribulation, and, and you know, over half the world's population is going to be destroyed. Well, how could God do that? Well, because he already predicted it, so he needs to keep his word. Jeez, that's ridiculous. I said, no, 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 he predicted it, so it's going to happen, and he's going to allow it to happen. Why? Well, because he has purposes that he's accomplishing. What? Well, he's going to exercise his vengeance against the earth. Why? Well, because they've rejected him all these years, and because, and you know, the Lord's going to come. He's going to wrap it all up. There'll be a new kingdom. <laughs> she hung the phone up. And I didn't get any more information. Do you think people want to hear this? No, they don't want to hear this. But the Bible says the commandment of God is holy. There's no sinful in it. And it's just. It's always fair. It's always right. What's the number one thing people, when they hear the law, say? They say, you mean to tell me you're for killing people because they do this? Boy, that is really fair, isn't it? It's a whole argument on do you believe the death penalty is a deterrent to crime? Well, of course it is. If you kill a guy, he can't do it again, right? Hello? But it isn't fair. Now, I don't believe in sending innocent people to, the, to death. Don't misunderstand. But you mean to tell me God is not fair? People say, well, he wiped people out for sexual perversion. Well, that's interesting because Israel has hardly a trace of sexual disease. Hello? But today it's different. Why? Because they're turning their back on God's law. You're telling me God is unjust for what he said? Now, I thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy and compassion. And I thank the Lord that he wants to reach people no matter what they've done and will forgive them. But don't tell me that God is unjust for the death penalty for crimes that in fact are endangering society. He's protecting thousands of people by even exercising the death penalty in the cases that are, that are mentioned. There's, there's something wrong with our thinking. And I know in our legal system today, we are more tolerant and, and we have... Uh, lots of laws, we arguments over imprisonment versus death penalty. I'm not here. I'm not a scholar in that field. I'm just here to tell you that God is fair in everything he said. Now, the third thing is that it's good. And, of course, that brings trouble to people's hearts because good, in this sense, means beneficial, the Greek word. So we got a problem here. In other words, the law reflects the character of God. It's not sinful at all. It's fair in everything it demands, and it is beneficial to us. Now, let's ask the question. How could the law of God, all those laws, be beneficial to us? Well, number one, it protects your own life. Number two, it protects your families. Number three, it protects society. It protects your property. Thou shalt not steal. It's a protection of private property. Why, all the basic laws of Western civilization, British and American law, are built on the Ten Commandments. Why? Because those laws were intended to protect God's people. Not to harm them and keep them from having fun. Wow, that's important, isn't it? Thou shalt not commit adultery. You tell me that's not a protection of marriage and a family? Honor your father and mother. You tell me that wouldn't be crucial to solving the problems of the elderly in our society? What's the matter with us? God's laws were given to protect us. There's nothing wrong with them. And they reflect the very nature and heart of God. He is holy, he is just, and he is good. And all God's people say. And I think there's where we're in a battle we're in a battle in our society today. They want nothing to do with this. They don't believe this. They don't have anything to do with it. They say it's man's opinion. No, it's not. It's a commandment of God. It is the law of God. Let's come to number five. Look at verse 13. We've said so far that the law removes our ignorance of sin. It resurrects our sinful desires. It requires the penalty of death and reflects the character of God himself. Number five, the law reminds us of how terrible sin is. Apparently, God wants this to be understood by his people. Verse 13, was then that which is good, if you say the law is good, made death unto me? God forbid. The law would bring life if you'd keep it. 
Well, what was the problem? It was sin. Look at this. But sin, that it might appear sin. See, the tendency of people is to water down what is sin and to make it acceptable or tolerable. But God says, no, I gave you the law to show you how bad it really is. Sin, that it might appear sin, worked death in me by that which is good. That's what sin does. That sin by the commandment, when God told us what was right and what's wrong, might become exceeding sinful. The whole point of this is, whatever is sin is sin. It's not that it becomes more sin, but it appears more exceedingly sinful to our hearts. We understand the nature of our sin and depravity. And folks, that's what chapter 7 is all about. He is going to wipe us out till we come out of that chapter knowing that we need the Lord's help. And without the Lord, we will never have victory in our life. You see, the people who are trying to follow the law in order to have that victory are missing the point. The more law, the more sin is exceedingly sinful. And we need to hear the law, but not to use the law to change us. No, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's a very important point. Let's come to a sixth matter in verse 14. The law not only reminds us of how terrible sin is, but the law reveals our own carnality. Boy, is that a simple verse or what? We know the law is spiritual. It's from the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God. But I am carnal, sold under sin. I'm in bondage to sin. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, I, brethren, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there's among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? You say, well, I'm just human. No, the issue is worse than that. You're walking like an unbeliever. Go to Ephesians, please, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The law reveals our carnality. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, Ephesians 4, 17. And testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, no standards of morality, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be, you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, that's the same phrase for carnality, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust they trick you, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And kind of interesting, the first application is put away lying. Why? Because the law said, thou shalt not bear false witness. You see, the law reveals our carnality. The more you understand God's standards, the more you see your inability to keep it. Incredible. A lot of people get the Big Ten and they think, oh, that's it. No, it's not. Those certainly are an embryo form, the nature of God. But friends, there are 613 commandments in God's law. By the way, I counted 191 from the lips of Jesus. And the Bible says, he said it, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What happens is every time the Lord tells me something I should do, guess what? I have an old sin nature that's bent the opposite way. I I want to do it, I want to keep it, but the ability to do it is not there, which is what Paul is going to deal with in our next message. 
The law truly does reveal our carnality. The more we speak of it and its glory and its rightness and its justice, the more we talk about it, the more it will reveal that we got a problem. Not God, not the law, we do. Which brings me to the seventh and final thing, why the law? The law reinforces our need of a Savior. And that justification and sanctification, both of them, are by faith in the finished work of the Messiah. Go to Galatians, please, chapter 2. There are many Bible teachers who will tell you that when you read Romans, you should also read Galatians with it. In Galatians chapter 2, pick it up, please, at verse 16. Galatians 2, verse 16. The law reinforces our need of a Savior and that justification and sanctification are by faith in the finished work of the Messiah. Galatians 2, 16. And I'm going to read several verses, so follow along if you can in your Bible. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, that's Romans 3, isn't it? Verse 28. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified or declared righteous by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, amen? That's true, isn't it? It's what Romans 7 just told us. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? And again, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified. Literally, it's perfect tense. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love this verse. Watch this carefully. Verse 21. I do not frustrate the what? What does it say? Remember how it all started in chapter 6? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. How can we who have experienced God's grace continue to sin? And here he says, I don't frustrate the grace of God, which gives me, of course, what I don't deserve. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Messiah, Christ, is dead in vain. He had no purpose. It was worthless. No meaning. If you could be righteous by keeping the law. Now come to chapter 3 and pick it up at verse number 19. Wherefore then, he asked, serves the law? In other words, same question we're asking. Why the law? It was added because of transgressions. To show us what sin is. Removing the ignorance, as we learned. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, the Messiah, of course. It was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, Moses. It was given to him, Mount Sinai. Now, a mediator is not of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? The promise of God was given to Abraham that a a seed, a descendant of his, would bless the entire world. Salvation is found in the Messiah. That was given around 21 100, 2185 B.C., somewhere in that neighborhood. Now, when was the law given? Not till 1400, 46 about, or maybe 40 years later, the wilderness. Well, when the law came, did it make the promise, therefore, of no effect? Should we now follow the law, or do we believe Abraham's promise that a Messiah is the answer? This is the whole argument here. Is the law against, verse 21, the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. By the law is a knowledge of sin. Why? That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, 
we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, our tutor, to bring us unto Messiah, unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. For after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, for you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And here he repeats Romans 6, 3. For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor bond nor free, neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I like that. You know what? Every time you read God's law, you're reading the Old Testament, you're going over it. Remember that God gave this so that you would be brought to Jesus Christ and you would know there is no other hope without him. The whole purpose of the law is to lead you to the Lord Jesus. Now, before we wrap that thought up and end this, let me give you an example. Does the law lay out a worship system in the tabernacle? Does it? Sure. Was there a number of items of furniture and all that God spent a lot of time talking to you about in his law? Why, sure. Did he tell you that there was an altar of sacrifice out there in the yard before you even got to the holy place and you had to put sacrifices there? Was that law? Absolutely. Did did he have a basin of water in front of the holy place where you were supposed to wash your hands and your feet as a priest Reminding yourself that you need to be daily cleansed before you go into the holiness and the holy presence of God. Yes. And when you walked into that holy place, was there a table on the right that had 12 loaves of bread reminding you that he's the bread of life? Yes. And were you to do that? Did God command that? Absolutely. And was there not a, a beautiful menorah? with seven golden candlesticks that had to be lit? Yes. And was there not a little altar in front of the second veil where you were to burn some incense and watch the smoke go up and it was to picture the prayer? Didn't you have to do that? Yes. And didn't the high priest go behind that curtain according to God's law once a year on the Day of Atonement? And did he not go with the blood of a goat and put it on the mercy seat like God said? Did not all of that Was it not told them by God? Was it not his commandments? Of course. You say, well, wait a minute. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that everything I just mentioned refers to Jesus Christ, my Lord. Everything. In other words, the whole law concerning a building and all of its furniture led us to Jesus Christ. Does not the law command over and over again to bring all these sacrifices? Don't you ever ask yourself the question if the Jews ever got tired? Do you know if you don't bring the sacrifice, you have sinned willfully and you're cut off from Israel forever? So you talk about a heavy-duty penalty. You are lost and headed for hell if you don't bring the sacrifice every time you sin. You tell me how many times do you sin in a day? And the Jews got to keep bringing those sacrifices. I mean, it's unbelievable. And they had to do it. And you say, what was that all about? All of these sacrifices were for what? To show us the only way to God was by sacrifice. And it pointed to the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Is everybody okay now? Do you understand everything God ever said in his law was a tutor, a schoolmaster, a trainer, of you and me to show us that we need a Savior and without him there's no hope. Amen? That's what it's all about. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for making it so evident by your word that you gave the law to show us that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. And the law would bring us to faith in Jesus Christ as our only way out. Lord, I don't know the hearts of these people, but you do. And some of us, we just play church, as it were. We just are 
loosely identified with the people of God, we have a weak commitment sometimes. Our profession is mere words. Lord, we are sinners. No wonder you said, confess your sins, and you are faithful and just to forgive us. The issue is our sin, and the law showed us what's right and what's wrong, and continues to do so. And it shows us how much we need you. Thank you, Lord, that when the Messiah died on the cross, every sin we've ever committed or could think of committing in the future was paid for. All of our sin was laid on him. And Lord, I would pray for those listening right now who are not really sure of their own relationship to you, that they might cry out to God, confessing, repenting of their sin, believing that Jesus Christ is who he claimed, that he's the one who can forgive them and give them everlasting life. Lord, I pray you would help us to turn to him before it's too late. And Lord, for all of us who know you and are walking through these interesting passages about sanctification, of learning how to live for the Lord, we're aware, Lord, that one thing we don't want to hear about is our own sinfulness and depravity. Yet all of life reminds us of it, and your law certainly does. Lord, help us to have a new honoring and appreciation in our hearts for the character that you expressed in your law. May we not question you and challenge it. May we see that that law has shown us clearly that we're sinners and that we need a Savior. May we learn what it means to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and not lean to our own understanding. Oh, God, help us, we pray. And as we move towards your principles of victory, may we, Father, find that our trust in the Lord is far more important than our human reasoning or our self-efforts to try to be good or better. Teach us, Lord, we pray. And it's in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Messiah and our Lord, that we pray and ask these things. Amen.